In Hebrew, we call the book of Numbers Be'midbar. Be'midbar, literally, in the wilderness. And the book of Numbers, among other things, typifies the Lamb's Book of Life, taking the census of those who entered the Promised Land after coming out of Egypt. It is one of the things which typifies the Lamb Book of Life in biblical typology. It is not it, but it typifies it. In any event, turn with me, please, to Numbers chapter 6. Heavenly Father, we ask you to meet with us now in the power and presence of your Spirit, in your grace, and in your mercy. Open our eyes, our minds, and above all our hearts to the glory and the meaning of your word. In your grace, Lord God, give us the wisdom and courage to be not only hearers of your word, but do us also in the name of your Son, Jesus, who is our only righteousness. The book of Numbers chapter 6, please. Most Christians are familiar with this chapter from the closing benediction at the end, the Aaronic benediction. In fact, some churches will actually include this Jewish blessing in their own liturgy. And we read from verse 22, And the Lord spoke again to Moshe the Benu, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his son, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and then I shall bless them. Now most Christians would be familiar with that blessing. You probably have heard it in churches or other such things. But what context does it occur in? And more importantly, what does it mean for us as believers? The law is, of course, fulfilled in Christ, but what does this blessing mean for us? How is it fulfilled in Jesus, and practically what does it mean for you and for me? It comes as the afterclimax of something called the vow of the Nazarite. The vow of the Nazarite. With that in view, let's read the context in which this blessing comes, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 6 of Numbers. Again the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When a man or woman takes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite to dedicate himself to the Lord, he shall abstain from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar, whether made from wine or strong drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice, nor eat any fresh or dried grapes. All the days of his separation, he shall not eat anything that is produced by the grapevine, from the seeds even to the skin. All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall pass over his head. He shall be holy until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord. He shall let the locks on his hair of his head grow long. All the days of his separation to the Lord, he shall not go near to a dead person. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister, when they die because the separation to God is on his head. Now we have a tape called Leviticus 21, the priests of the Lord, the living and the dead, where we explain the typology of corpses. Corpses are Old Testament figures of unsaved people. When you believe in Jesus, in John 5, 24, you pass from death to life. Paul says we were dead in our sins. In biblical typology, dead bodies are figures of unsaved people. I only mention that in passing to do justice to the text, but let's resume in verse 8. All the days of his separation, he is holy to the Lord. But if a man dies very suddenly next to him, and he defiles his dedicated head of hair, then he shall shave his head on the day when he becomes clean. He shall shave it on the seventh day. Then on the eighth day, which is the day of the resurrection, he shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the priest to the doorway of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall offer one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering and make atonement for him concerning his sin because of the dead person. And at the same day he shall consecrate his head. And he shall dedicate to the Lord his days as a Nazarite. And he shall bring a male lamb, a year old, for a guilt offering, but the former days shall be void because his separation was defiled. Now this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall bring the offering to the doorway of the tent of meeting. And he shall present his offering to the Lord, one male lamb a year old without defect for a burnt offering, and one new lamb a year old without defect for a sin offering, and one ram without defect for a peace offering, and a basket of unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil and unleavened wafers spread with oil, along with their grain offering and their libations. Then the priest shall present them before the Lord and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. 
He shall also offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord, together with the basket of unleavened cakes. The priest shall likewise offer its grain offering and its libation. The Nazarite shall then shave his dedicated head of hair at the doorway of the tent of meeting, and take the dedicated hair of his head and put it on the fire which is under the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall take the ram's shoulder when it's been boiled and one unleavened cake out of the basket and one unleavened wafer and he shall put them on the hands of the Nazarite, literally in Hebrew on the palms of the Nazarite, after he has shaved his dedicated head of hair. Then the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. It is holy for the priest together with the breast offered by waving and the thigh offered by lifting up. And afterwards the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite who vows his offering to the Lord according to his separation, in addition to what else he can afford, according to his vow which he takes, so he shall do according to the law of his separation. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his son, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel, and say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord let the countenance upon you and grant you peace. So they shall invoke my name upon the sons of Israel, and then I will bless them. We have a number of outstanding Nazarites in the Bible, a number in both Testaments. We have Elijah. We have Yochanan Hamatbil. That was John the Baptist's real name in the character of Elijah. Separated himself, the long hair, the whole bit the same way. Perhaps most famous of all, of course, we have Samson, Shimshon. And the last Nazarite recorded in the Bible is, of course, Paul the Apostle. In the book of Acts, chapter 21, when he'd become a reproach, he took the vow of the Nazarite. The question becomes, since the law is fulfilled in the Messiah, since the Messiah has come, and since the law is katorgeo in Greek, non-operative, it can't operate anymore, uh, why did Paul take this vow? Now, obviously, he took the vow based on 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He was culturally identifying with the people he was trying to reach. There is nothing wrong with taking on the culture of the people you are trying to reach as long as there's nothing in it which is morally wrong or demonic. And Paul said, I become as all things to all people that I might reach them, to those who are under the law as one under the law, though not being under the law myself. We have two kinds of people. We have people who are hyper-messianic extremists. Now, my own family are Israeli Jews. Be very careful of Jewish believers and those who sometimes are not Jews who will try to put people back under the law, who will try to rebuild the wall of partition, who will try to make non-Jews appear to be almost second-rate believers. There is no such thing as a second-rate believer. It's not being born a Jew that matters. It's being born again. A Gentile Christian is as good as a Jewish Christian, and a fact that a Jew who doesn't believe is cut off from his own olive tree. Uh, great tragedy, but that's what it teaches. Now again, I have an Israeli family. There is nothing special about Jews as individuals. What there is so special about is the God of the Jews, the covenant of the Jews, the book of the Jews, and the Messiah of the Jews. What makes them special is God's covenantal dealing with them. Queensland has been a big problem. We have people here who are influenced by neo-Nazi beliefs from America, uh, people who sort of combine these extreme views of King James only with Pauline Hanson type politics. And they're very anti-Semitic, among other things, unfortunately. And they have a great hatred for Jews who believe in Jesus. And they write some terrible, terrible lies against Arnold Fruchtenbaum and myself and others. And it's been most unfortunate. Uh, these things are absolutely ludicrous. Uh, we don't believe in going back under the law. We believe the law is fulfilled in Jesus, but we have to understand what the law means. Most of, the new, most of the Bible is not the New Testament, but it is the Old Testament. More than two-thirds of the Word of God is the Old Testament, and you will only have a superficial understanding of the New Testament unless you understand it in light of its Old Testament background, what we call the Tanakh. And Paul attempts to do that repeatedly. And with the vow of the Nazarite, he takes it at a time he had become a reproach. A at a time he'd become a reproach. But more of that in a while. So you have people who are trying to lift up Jewishness instead of Jesusness. When you find people in the Messianic movement who are lifting up Jewishness instead of Jesusness, look out. But when you have people who are teaching against the Jewishness of the New Testament, like the Dispatches Organization and these other people with the bigotry in Queensland who are against Jewish believers, look out for that as well. Neither one are biblical. Both are absolutely false. 
So let's begin at the beginning. We have Elijah, we have John the Baptist, we have Samson, we have Paul. All of these Nazarites, the laws fulfilled in Jesus, what does it mean for us? Why does Paul do it? What does it mean for believers? Let's begin at the very beginning. I don't have access to an adequate PowerPoint facility tonight, so I'll go back to the 20th century. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew. Matthew chapter 2, Matthew's nativity narrative, verse 23. At the very end of Matthew's Gospel, chapter, 22, uh, chapter 2, verse 23, we read a prophecy about Jesus, Matthew says, that he shall be called a Nazarene, that the Messiah shall be called a Nazarene, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 23. When the Gospels quote from the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and say this is a messianic prophecy about the Messiah, and now it's fulfilled, Here's the prophecy, now it's fulfilled in Jesus. This is what theologians call a formula citation. A formula citation. You have 11 formula citations in Matthew's Gospel alone, and four just in the Nativity narrative. Just four surrounding the birth of Jesus. The first is in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, or a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. That is the first formula citation. It comes directly from the prophet Isaiah, Ishayahu Hanavi, Isaiah the prophet, chapter 7, verse 14. The word in Hebrew there for virgin is Alma, also a word for young woman, but it's translated virgin, Parthenos, in the Septuagint. <clears throat> and that word is translated seven times virgin in the Septuagint. A virgin shall conceive. There it is, Isaiah 7, 14. Now it's fulfilled in Jesus. No problem, prediction fulfillment. The second formula citation is the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 2, verse 15. Out of Egypt that I call my son. That's the second one, out of Egypt that I call my son. That is straight from the prophet Hoshea Hanavi, Hosea the prophet, chapter 11, verse 1. Hosea 11, 1. Here's the prediction, here's the fulfillment, no problem. Straight down the line, prediction fulfillment. The third one is in Matthew chapter 2, verse 18. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping, weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they were no more. That is Jeremiah 31, 15. No problem, Jeremiah 31, 15, a formula citation. Prediction, fulfillment. But this final one in verse 23, he shall be called a Nazarene, is a big problem. And of course, rabbis have a field day with this in attacking the credibility of the New Testament when they try to persuade Jews not to believe in Jesus. The problem is this. There is no such verse anywhere in the Old Testament. There is no such verse anywhere in the Tanakh. Did Matthew make a mistake? How can an infallible God who inspired him to write it make a mistake? He can't. What is the explanation? How can Matthew give us this formula citation when there's no such verse, he shall be called a Nazarene? To answer that question and to look at this subject of the vow, take a look at this if you can. What you have is a word play, a word play. In Hebrew, the word Nazarene comes from the word nezer, nezer, nezer. There's no such verse that says the Messiah shall be called a Nazarene. But there are a lot of verses that the Messiah shall be called a Netzer. Netzer, which means branch, branch. Let's look at one, the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 1. Isaiah gives a prophecy about the Messiah, which the rabbis even agrees about the Messiah. And Isaiah tells us the Messiah shall be a righteous branch. Then a shoot or a netzer will stem, uh, a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, the shortish Ishai, and a branch, a netzer, from his roots will bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And the rabbis are uniform in their agreement that this is a prophecy about the Messiah. We read about it in such rabbinic tractates as Sanhedrin 98b. The rabbis admit it's about the Messiah. So there's nothing that says that the 
Messiah will be a Nezer. But there are a lot of things that say that the Messiah will be a Netzer. And in this same chapter, verse 10, the nations will resort to the root of, Esh, of, of Jesse. The Goyim will resort to the Shoresh Ishai. Whoever the Messiah was, he had to make the Gentile nations believe in the Jewish God. Why did the people in Venezuela and the Philippines and people in the Congo and people in California and people in the Gold Coast of Australia believe in the God of the Jews? Because Isaiah said the Messiah would make them believe it. Even the, the, the most influential and, and unfortunately misguided rabbi of history, Rambam, Moses Maimonides, admitted Christianity came in his book, The Guide for the Perplexed, to turn the Gentiles into monotheists. So there's no verse that says the Messiah will be a Netzer, none. But there are a lot of verses that say he will be a Netzer, not a Nezer, but a Netzer. There is one letter difference between Nezer and Netzer. This letter is Zayn, but this letter in Hebrew is the letter Tzadik. In Hebrew, you pronounce this letter Zet, Z, Nezer. But this letter is pronounced Tz, Tz. There's a difference in Hebrew between Zet and Tz, Tz. And Netzer is the righteous branch. But curiously, the one letter difference is the letter Tzadik, Tzadik. Now, tzaddik is also not only the name of a letter in Hebrew, but tzaddik is also the Hebrew word for a righteous person. If I was praying in Hebrew, I would have said, I did say, Yeshua tzidkatenu, Jesus our righteousness, or our righteous one. Jesus, Yeshua tzidkatenu. The one letter difference is that tzaddik, it's the name of a letter, but it's also the Hebrew word for a righteous person. So what we see, first of all, is it's a word play, a word play. You use word play in all kinds of languages, even in English. There's a famous author from Ireland called James Joyce who invented his own literary genre called stream of consciousness. It's very mystical and psychological. And he would use one word that sounded like another word, usually to make jokes or to satirize something. For instance, he might say, if you read some of his books like Finnegan's Wake or Ulysses, he'd say crazy things like, Instead of let us synchronize our watches, let us sympathize our watches. When I was a kid, one of the Beatles wrote a book imitating the style of James Joyce. It was called A Spaniard in the Works, and on the cover was a picture of John Lennon dressed like a, a Spanish bullfighter holding a wrench. And he called it A Spaniard in the Works instead of A Spanner in the Works. This is wordplay. In English, you use wordplay as a joke, or you use it as an advertising gimmick. I remember when I was a little boy in New York, I saw an advertisement in the newspaper for a company that sold coal, and it was called Quality Coal, only instead of spelling it C-O-A-L, they spelled it K-O-A-L. In English, we use wordplay to make a joke or as an advertising gimmick. In Biblical Hebrew, however, it's the opposite. In the Bible, you use wordplay to make a very serious point, to draw people's attention to a text. You use one word that sounds like another, to draw people's attention to something very serious and very important. As one example, look at the book of Amos chapter 8, please. Amos Hanavi, Amos chapter 8. And this is what Amos tells us. God says to Amos, what do you see? In verse 1. Thus says the Lord, he showed me a basket there, and there was a basket of summer fruit. And he said, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. Now, if fruit is not harvested by the summer in Israel, the hot sun will burn it up. The Hebrew word for summer is kayetz, kayetz, priya kayetz, summer fruit, kayetz. But the Hebrew word for end, as in terminal end, is ketz, summer, kayetz, end, ketz. He uses one word that sounds like another to draw people's attention to the fact that God's judgment is coming on the northern kingdom. He's warning about the approaching Samarian, uh, the, the approaching Syrian invasion of Samaria. Kayetz, ketz. When you see word play in the original Hebrew text, God is trying to draw our attention to something very important. And Matthew only does what the Hebrew writers had always done. He is using a word play. But he uses it about Jesus. So right away we begin to see 
that somehow the Nazarite, the Nazarite is a picture of the Nazarene. The Nazarite is a picture of the Nazarene, an Old Testament foreshadowing of the Messiah Jesus. Now Jesus was not a Nazarite. He was not a Nazarite. But the Nazarites were shadows of the Nazarene. But let's see how, and more importantly, let's see what it means for us. The two most distinguishing characteristics of a Nazarite were total abstinence not only from alcohol, but anything that even had the remote possibility of fermentation and becoming alcohol. Anyone who tries to tell you that Jesus didn't drink real wine is quite mistaken, I assure you. Greek, the word for wine and juice can be the same word, but in Hebrew we have two distinct different words. We have meats and we have the word yain, two entirely different words. Jesus said you can't put new wine in old wine skins, they'll burst because there's obviously a fermentation reaction. You have a CO2 byproduct that had to be alcoholic. Now we know from the Mishnah that the wine Jesus would have drunk was two parts water and only one part wine. You wouldn't get drunk drinking even a large amount of it. Nonetheless, he certainly drank alcohol. But a Nazarite could drink no alcohol. He could have no wine. Why was a Nazarite during the period of his vow restricted from drinking any wine until his vow was complete? Turn with me, please, to understand this to the book of Psalms, Psalm 104, verse 15. And wine which makes a man's heart glad, so that he may make his face glisten with oil. Wine makes a man's heart glad. Wine is a figure of various things in Scripture, sometimes the Holy Spirit, sometimes the blood of Jesus, but wine is frequently associated in biblical literary symbolism with joy as it remains to this day in Jewish culture. Look with me, please, to the book of Judges, chapter 9. Judges, chapter 9. Nine. Verse 12, And the trees said to the vine, You reign over us. But the vine said to them, Shall I leave my new wine which cheers God and men and go wave over other trees? Cheers. Wine is a figure of joy in the Bible. Every Jewish religious ritual practically involves wine. On a sad occasion, the wine is poured out. It is a libation offering. It's not consumed, it is poured out. Again, foreshadowing things about the suffering of Christ. On happy occasions, the wine is always drunk. You always drink it. On Passover, you have four ritual cups of wine. The Last Supper was a Passover Seder, and there was four cups of wine. And two of them are cited in the Gospel, cup of redemption and the cup of blessing. Then we have Kiddush. Every Friday night, observant Jewish families observe Kiddush Shabbat, the blessing of the Sabbath. And you bless it with a little bit of wine. So too at a bar mitzvah. A bar mitzvah requires the ritual use of wine. A Jewish wedding requires the ritual use of a shared cup of wine. Every Jewish occasion where there is a ritual commemorating or, or to do with something that is in some way happy or joyful will always require wine. Every, the ritual use of wine on happy occasions is there for almost every major Jewish occasion. And this again derives from the scripture. Wine makes a man's heart glad. That's why they do it. But the Nazarite could have no wine. He could have no joy because the Nazarite is an Old Testament picture of the Nazarene. Turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 53. Ishayahu Perek Nun Gimel, Isaiah the prophet, chapter 53. Who has believed our report in verse 1? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form of majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. 
and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried. He was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Our sorrows he carried. Jesus knew no joy this side of his sacrifice. He knew no joy. He knew no joy. Not until the sacrifice was complete did he know joy. He was destined. Not until you get to the end of this prophetic chapter do you see him experience anything joyful. Well, he's sad. He's a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. The Nazarite prefiguring the Nazarene could know no joy whatsoever. We'll come back to that, but let's look at the second most distinguishing feature of the Nazarene, his haircut, his hairstyle, his kofiyah. Look very briefly at the description of the Levite's kofiyah in the book of, of, of Ezekiel chapter 44, please. Ezekiel chapter 44. We read this. In verse 20, also they shall not shave their heads, yet they shall not let the locks of their hair grow long. They shall only trim the hair of their heads. The normal thing, culturally, was not to have excessively long hair, nor was it to shave your head. Either a shaved head or excessively long hair, both of which were abnormal and would have made you look like an outcast. Excessively long hair meant you were under reproach meant you were under some kind of reproach or under some kind of suffering. Excessively long hair meant you were, it was a social symbol of reproach or suffering, and it made people unattractive. They're the kind of people you wouldn't want to sit next to in the synagogue, or in modern terms, you wouldn't ride next to them on the train. It made them a reproach. And so the Messiah was one from whom men would turn their faces, we're told in Isaiah. He was somebody people wouldn't look at. The only description of what Jesus looked like physically, personally, that we have in the Bible is the prophecy in Isaiah that tells us he was not a particularly good-looking individual. But more than that, he was one from whom men would turn their faces. He was specifically unattractive. The Nazarite became unattractive. If you had somebody who may have been a good-looking person, a, a, a film star or something like this, but you let his hair grow and his beard grow and he's got long and long and long, he would look weird. It didn't matter how good-looking he was, unkept and long, ungroomed hair that was uncut would make them appear unattractive. But the other was when the hair was shaved. The Levites were not to shave their head off either. The shaving or removal of hair meant that you were publicly humiliated. It meant you were publicly humiliated by your opponents, that you were conquered by your enemies. We read this, for instance, in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 4. When some of David's men were captured by their opponents, they shaved half their heads and their beards. And David said, stay here until your humiliation goes away. In other words, until the hair grows back. So excessively long hair meant you were a reproach. But removed hair meant you were humiliated and defeated. And thus we read in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, they ripped Jesus' hair out. I gave my back to the smiters and his hair, it says in that verse, they just ripped it out. They just pulled his hair out. One is a picture of reproach, the other is a picture of humiliation. And so it was. Paul takes the vow of the Nazarite in the book of Acts 21 when he'd become a reproach. First, he'd been a reproach among his fellow rabbis. He had been somebody who rode with the hunters, and now he's running with the foxes. He was educated in the rabbinic school of Rabbi Hillel, a disciple of Rabbi Gamaliel. He would have had distinguished classmates that we know about from Judaism like Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and Rabbi Anklios, famous rabbis even in Talmudic Judaism. Paul would have come from good stock, but now he'd become a reproach in the Jewish community, and especially among his fellow rabbis, he was now a reproach. Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus was a reproach. Then he became a reproach among his fellow Roman citizens. A reproach. But by the time he gets to Acts 21, he becomes a reproach in the church because he wouldn't snub off or turn his back on Gentile Christians. He was saying that they were as good as Jewish believers, and he was saying that they don't have to come under bondage of the law. He'd become a reproach even in the church because of his stand. At one point, we're told in the book of Galatians, he even publicly accosted Peter because of Peter's attitude towards non-Jews. Hence, Paul had been a reproach among the rabbis. Then he'd been a reproach among the Romans. 
And finally, he'd been a reproach even in the church. And it is then he takes the vow of the Nazarite. The Nazarite speaks of those who take the reproach of the Lord. It is a voluntary vow. Nobody made you take it. It was voluntary. Some were born into it, but it was not compulsory for anyone else. The reproach of the Lord. Let's look at the most famous Nazarite we know of. He's not the only one, but he's the most famous one because of the Sunday school stories we tell our children. Turn with me, please, to the book of Judges, chapter 13. We call Judges in Hebrew, Shoftim. Shoftim, the book of Judges, chapter 13. Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, in verse 1, so that the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines 40 years. 40 in the Bible is the number of testing, number of testing. Israel sojourned 40 years in the wilderness. Moses fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. 40 is the number of testing in biblical typology. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had borne no children. Now, he was a man out of place geographically. He was from the Danites. He should have been living in the very far north, above north of Galilee, on the Lebanese border, in the area apportioned to the tribe of Dan by Joshua. Instead, he was living in the south, in a place near Kiryat Jerim, not too far from Jerusalem, actually near a place called Beth Shemesh. If you come with us to Israel, we always take people to this place. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and give birth to a son. Now therefore be careful not to drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing, for behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son. And no razor shall come upon his head, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Notice twice the definite article. Very awesome. And I did not ask him where he had come from, nor did he tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son. And now you shall not drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. The Nazarite, the, then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom thou hast sent come to us again, that, we, that he may teach us what to do for the boy who was to be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God, the angel of God, came again to the woman as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came the other day has appeared to me. Then Manoah arose and followed his wife, and when he came to the man, he said to him, Are you the man who spoke to the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now when your words come to pass, what shall be the boy's mode of life and his vocation? So the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, said to Manoah, Let the woman pay attention to all that I said. She should not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. Let her observe all that I commanded. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you so that we may prepare a kid for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food. <clears throat> but if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? So that when your words come to pass, we may honor you. But the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the kid, etc. The angel of the Lord. Let me point out a few nuances of the Hebrew text that don't come across well in the translation. Hamel ak Adonai. Not an angel, but the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is known in Judaism by the rabbis as the Metatron, the Metatron. As believers in Jesus, we know it as a Christophany, a Christophany, an Old Testament manifestation of Jesus in the flesh. When God heard, when Adam heard God walking in the garden, that was Jesus. The Metatron means he was at the center of the throne, but we know it as 
the angel of the Lord to be a Christophany. The angel who closed the mouths of the lions in the lion's den was not an angel of the Lord, but it was the Metatron. Hamalak Adonai. It was the angel of the Lord. It was Jesus. When Jacob wrestled at Peniel at the brook of Jabbok with the angel of the Lord, he saw him as the face of God. It was Jesus. And here again, it is Jesus. It is not an angel, but the text specifies ten times the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord. Now, in the worldview of the ancient Near East, if you knew the name of a spiritual being, you could have some kind of control or leverage over him. So, to know the name meant you could have some power. That is why you see the references to the name. He didn't tell me his name. Why do you ask my name? When he says, why do you ask my name? For it is wonderful. The Hebrew word there is Pele. Pele. Pele is not the ordinary Hebrew word for wonderful. It is the word for wonderful only ever used for God. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, to us a child is born, a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be Pele Yoetz, wonderful counselor, Abiad, eternal father, El Gabor, God Almighty, and Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Pele is only ever used for God. But more than that, in verse 11, are you the man who spoke to the woman? And the angel of the Lord says to her, I am, I am. In biblical Hebrew, you don't say you are the I am unless you are. That's what God means. Remember in John 9, they wanted to stone Jesus for saying before Abraham was in Greek, ego ami, I am, I am. You don't say you are the I am. The Hebrew answer would have been, if you were, you would have said, Ken. Or you would have said, Ani Hu. But you wouldn't say, you are the I am. Unless you are. The first formula citation we read in Matthew was that the Messiah would be conceived of a virgin. Every supernatural pregnancy in the Old Testament and in the New is a figure, a foreshadowing of the Messiah's supernatural conception and birth. Every one. Most of these, of course, were geriatric pregnancies. It goes back all the way, of course, to Sarah. It moves ahead. We see this with the parents of Samson. We see it with the parents of Samuel the prophet. We see it with the parents of, once more, Yohanan Hamat Biel, John the Baptist. All of these supernatural conceptions foreshadow that the Messiah would be supernaturally conceived. Now look at this narrative, this story. You have a Jewish woman who is visited by an angel of the Lord, in this case, the angel of the Lord, who tells her that she will supernaturally conceive a son. That this son will die. That he will deliver Israel. And that he will be a Nazarite. She would supernaturally conceive a son. The angel comes, an angel comes, shall supernaturally conceive a son, who will deliver Israel, he will die, and he will be called a Nazarite. And of course, another angel of the Lord, Gabriel, Gabriel, the mighty one of God, comes to another Jewish woman and tells her that she will supernaturally conceive a son. The angel comes, she'll conceive a son, that he will die, he will deliver Israel, and he will be called a Nazarene. And in both cases, their respective husbands weren't there when it happened. The angel had to come back again to, the, to Manoah, the wife of Manoah, and the angel had to come back to Yosef, to Joseph, and explain further. But we notice here that not only would the son not be able to drink wine, neither would his mother. Neither would his mother. Why could his mother not drink wine? Again, turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 2. The prophecy of Simeon in verse 34. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, a sign to be opposed, and a sword will pierce even your own soul, to the end that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Mary was going to suffer because of what happened to her son. And so the mother of Samson, who prefigures Jesus, is told the same thing. Every Nazarite is a foreshadowing of the Nazarene, every one. So the mother's the same. You know, because of the heretical errors and superstition of Roman Catholicism, 
concerning the cult of Mary and Mariolatry, evangelicals have traditionally been afraid to go near Mary. I assure you her real name was Miriam. Her name was not Mary. She did not have blonde hair and blue eyes. She was a Jewish girl with dark features, probably only a teenager. And the Magnificat to Mary is, has its literary foreshadowing in the Song of Deborah, Blessed Are You Among Women, from the Septuagint text of the book of Judges, chapter 5. There was nothing wrong with Miriam. Miriam was told by Gabriel she was the greatest woman who ever lived. Now, the greatest woman who ever lived, when she was told she would be the mother of the Messiah, she responded, my soul rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary, of course, says she needs a Savior. She had to be saved from sin because her son would save his people from their sin. If the greatest woman who ever lived tells me she needs a Savior, that's good enough for me. If God puts it in his word, that's good enough for me. I have a problem. The Roman Catholic Church teaches Mary is the Immaculate Conception. She had no sin. Who do I believe? Is Mary telling the truth or is the Pope telling the truth? Now, if the greatest woman who ever lived tells me she needs a savior, personally, I believe Mary. Only her name was not Mary. Her name was Miriam. I like Miriam. I love Miriam. I esteem Miriam. I think Miriam is fantastic. I think Miriam is sensational. I think Miriam is absolutely terrific but I don't want anything to do with that stupid, dumb, blonde, bimbo shik Mary, who is nothing but the Catholicization of Minerva worship, Diana of Ephesus, etc. There's nothing wrong with Miriam. Mary's the problem. Why is Mary going to suffer? Because her son would suffer. Not as an atonement. But you see, when someone takes the reproach of the Lord, it affects even their family. It will affect their, affect their family to a degree. Now you've got to understand this. What happens to Shimshon? We know what happens to him. Let's look very briefly to the book of Judges, chapter 16, and see his demise. The good women in the Bible foreshadow the bride of Christ. They are pictures of the bride of Christ. I won't go into this, we have plenty of tapes explaining this. But the wicked women of the Bible foreshadow the harlot in the book of Revelation. This is particularly true of the woman Jezebel. Jesus says, you tolerate the woman Jezebel who seduces my servants. In the Bible, sexual seduction is an illustration of spiritual seduction. Okay? It goes to the Hebrew word znut, whoredom or, or harlotry. In James's epistle, he draws on this. He calls worldly churches, you adulteresses. When Israel went after other gods, God called the idolatry adultery. O daughter of Zion, you've played the harlot. Israel was to be God's woman the way the church is the bride of Christ. Okay? They went after other gods, the idolatry is called adultery. Hence, sexual seduction is a picture of spiritual seduction. There's two meanings in this text. When you understand what the New Testament is doing, Paul and Jesus, and of course they were rabbis. Jesus' real name was Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef Minetzedet. Paul's name was Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus. And like Matthew, they were expounding the scriptures in the same way of the other rabbis of the day. They were doing things different, but their technique and approach was not different. If you want to know why the New Testament handles the Old Testament the way it does, don't listen to the liberal heretics like John Spong or Barbara Thiering. Just read the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you'll see that the New Testament, the Gospels, are not doing anything different than the other Jewish texts of the day did in the way they handled the Scripture. It's perfectly plausible and justifiable the way the New Testament handles the Old when you understand it as, as Second Temple period Jewish literature. Of course, the liberals try to say otherwise. Nonetheless, let's understand this. We have a picture here of the Nazarite, and in biblical typology, he gets seduced. The literal, simple, straightforward meaning is known as a peshet, peshet, a peshet. A peshet is the straightforward meaning from the Hebrew word pashut, meaning simple. The spiritual interpretation of a peshet is the pesher, the pesher, the pesher. Okay. For instance, we read the formula citations. 
Hosea of chapter 11, verse 1. He says, out of Egypt I called my son. Now, if you were to read Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, he's talking about the exodus of the Jews out of Egypt with Moses. He's talking of the exodus. But Matthew says that's about Jesus. The peshet, the simple meaning, is the peshet. It's about the exodus. The pesher is, it's about Jesus. In Midrash, Jewish exegesis of the time of Jesus and Paul, you never base a doctrine on a symbol or a type or allegory. That's Gnosticism. That's pagan. But you use symbolism to illustrate doctrine, like Jesus does. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. He uses sexual seduction to illustrate spiritual seduction. And there is much typology in the story of Samson for the church in the last days, how it loses its sight and its strength, but is then revived. But let's go look at this, what happens with Delilah. In chapter 16, she's trying to con him. Verse 13 in chapter 16, up to now you've deceived me and told me lies. Tell me the truth, how you may be bound. And he said to her, if you weave the seven locks of my hair with the web, and fasten it with the pin, I shall become weak and be like any other man. So while we slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his hair and wove them into the web. And she fastened it with the pin and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep, pulled out the pin of the loom and the web. Notice she begins, he begins toying with her piecemeal. His first mistake was not telling her, don't cut my hair. His first mistake is letting her know that his hair had something to do with the strength. That's how spiritual seduction works. You know, the devil doesn't tempt us to go out and commit adultery. He attempts us to begin looking at somebody's wife or somebody's husband. That's what he does. He doesn't attempt, you know, stage by stage, as it says in James's epistle. You give up one thing, and then you set yourself up for the next thing. That's the way seduction always works. Again, that is the peshit. And then there's the pesha. So it goes on. How can you say you love me? Verse 15. When your heart's not with me, you've deceived me these three times and have not told me where your great strength is. And it came about when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him that his soul was annoyed to death. She just nagged him. So he told her all that was in his heart. And he said, a razor's never come in my head. I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaved, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak like any other man. Now again, the peshet and the pesher. It's amazing how a man chosen by God, a man of such unique character and strength, could be a sucker for a babe. Let that be a lesson to the rest of us. But turn with me, please, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 5. We read in chapter 5 of the book of Proverbs, verses 8 and 9, the following. Keep your way far from her, and don't go near to her house, lest you give your vigor to others and your strength or your years to the cruel ones, lest strangers be filled with your strength. And what does Samson do? He gives his strength to others because he got involved with her, and the cruel ones exploit it. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 24 to 26, we read this in chapter 6. To keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress, do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her catch you with her eyelids. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread, and an adulteress hunts for a precious life. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 21. But first look at verse 20. He's taken a bag of money. At full moon he will come. The man's not at home. He's gone on a journey in verse 19. False religion knows that Jesus is coming back. With her many persuasions, she entices him. With her flattering lips, she seduces him. The peshet is sexual seduction. I live in England. In England, the prostitutes hang out in a place called Soho in London. And they say things like, Good time, dearie. Hello, lovey. In New York, they're not quite so eloquent. They say, Want to go out? Well, that's the peshet. Keep away from floozies. Keep away from immoral women who are only trying to exploit you. That's the peshet. The pesher is spiritual seduction. He allows himself to be seduced. Where is your strength? The strength was in his hair. What is the hair? The reproach of the Lord. It made him a reproach. 
pay attention. Those who voluntarily take the reproach of the Lord will be endowed from on high with a supernatural strength that unsaved people will not be able to understand and either will carnal Christians be able to comprehend or match. The reproach of the Lord is a source of strength in itself. I was in Perth a few weeks ago and I speak to believers there from Romania who immigrated to Australia from Romania. I was there with a now a middle-aged woman, but as a young girl, the communists arrested her. Her father was a, a Pentecostal preacher. And they did unspeakable things to her, not decent to mention in a church or anywhere else if you didn't have to, but you can imagine what some of the things they did to this rather attractive young woman. And, 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 but they also put her hands into a door and systematically broke her knuckles and her fingers, trying to get her to talk about where the others were and things like this. You know, when you meet people like this who've suffered for their faith, you wonder where they got the character and strength to stand up and face some persecution. When I was in Africa last year, the Muslims were burning little children ages five through nine in the Sudan. Nobody says a word. You know, when the Muslims put people in jail for becoming Christians in Malaysia, when they burn Christians out of house and home in the Philippines or Indonesia, not far from here, when they happily execute people for believing in Jesus in the Arabian Peninsula. Nobody says a word. But every time the Israelis stand up to Islamic fundamentalism, it's all over the front pages. Look what the nasty Jews are doing. Last month you had Muslims rioting in England. One week later, when the Australian cricket team came, the Muslims began throwing debris and projectiles at the Australian cricket team. Because to them, it's not a sport. It's jihad. It's Islam against Christianity. You think of it as a sport, they think of it as jihad. Last, the week before last, they were rioting in the north of Australia. This is not racist. It is not against Arabs or against Asians. The persecution of Arab and Asian Christians is unbelievable. It's always a one-way street with Islam. Always. How are those believers, you know, it's a, how, many, how many resolutions did the United Nations pass against Malaysia for the persecution of Christians and for an apartheid policy against the Chinese, not even one. How many resolutions did they pass against the Saudi Arabians for hanging a 15-year-old boy for putting his faith in Jesus? Not even one. How many, how many resolutions did they pass against one Muslim country after another for killing Christians? Not even one. How many resolutions did they pass against Israel for standing up to that fundamentalism? Dozens. The Lord sees that hypocrisy. The Lord sees that hypocrisy. Well, how did these believers, how could these children, ages five to nine, stand being burned alive? They began with the five-year-olds and they burned the little ones in the, eyes, in the eyes before their older siblings. How could they take the reproach of the Lord like that in the Sudan? These are kids. How could they stand in Romania under that kind of persecution? You know, what I go through or Philip Powell goes through, it's nothing like what they go through. But like Paul, you also become a reproach in the church. It's one thing when the rabbis rejected him, it was another thing when the Romans rejected him, but when the church rejected him for standing for the truth, that hurts. How did Paul keep going when he became a reproach? Look at 2 Corinthians, he tells us. In chapter 4, Paul tells us the following. Verse 8, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh, so death works in us, but life in you. You see, those who take the reproach of the Lord will let death work in them, that life can come to others like Jesus did. Because the Nazarites are like the Nazarene. What does he say? Afflicted, but not crushed, perplexed, not despairing, persecuted, not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. How does he put up with that rejection? First by the rabbis, then by the Romans, then by the church. Twice shipwrecked, repeatedly flogged, left for dead, stoned, imprisoned, and then rejected. And then in 2 Timothy, knifed in the back by people he led to Christ. What made him keep going like that? 
He'd been a reproach. The secret is in the hair. The reproach of the Lord is a source of strength in itself. Those Christians who will be the strongest are those who take his reproach. And the world won't be able to understand your strength. And either will a worldly church. They'll try to get it by spiritual seduction. They'll send Delilah. They'll send a harlot church. But the world won't understand it. But they'll want it. They'll want you to get rid of it. Look what Amos said in chapter 2. Verse 11, Amos says this, I raised up some of your sons to be prophets and some of your young men to be Nazarites. Is this not so, O sons of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarite drink wine. What do they say? Have a drink. You're too religious. Be joyful. Come to Toronto. Go to Pensacola. That's what Phil Pringle and, the, and, and, and these other guys were saying. Brian Houston, that's what they were pushing. Have a drink. Rodney Howard Brown. Get drunk. Have a drink. You're too religious. That's what they're saying. Don't take the reproach of the Lord. You see, they're weak. They're being defeated by the enemies, by the Philistines. What's happening in Britain is now coming to Australia. Since the laughing thing and the drunken thing, more mosques have been built in England than churches. In the last 10 years of Alpha courses, there's been a 22% decline in church attendance in Great Britain where Alpha comes from, and the Church of England alone loses 1,000 people a week. They gave us Alpha. They're being defeated by the Philistine. Things don't work. They don't have the strength. It's those who take the reproach of the Lord who have the strength and they know it and they resent it and they want it. Have a drink. Make the Nazarite drink wine. Stop being so religious. Come to Hillsong and have a laugh. That's what they say. That's not what God says. You want to be a strong Christian, you voluntarily take his reproach and God will give you a strength. The world won't understand it and a worldly church won't understand it, but you'll have that strength. I've seen that strength among persecuted Christians in Africa, in the Middle East, where I was a missionary for years. I've seen that strength. I've seen that strength. Those who take the reproach of the Lord, and they'll tell you, have a drink, get a haircut. Why? So I can be weak like you? The big numbers couldn't defeat the Philistine. It only took one man sold out to God who had the strength of the Lord because he took the reproach. Anytime it's always been the one man. A Whitfield, a Wesley, a Spurgeon, a Moody. One. When John Wesley began preaching in England, the Church of England used to incite riots and mobs against him. He was banned from churches for preaching the truth. Revival came to Mother Britain, it was because of one man, two men, three men, Whitfield, Wesley. Those who took the reproach of the Lord, he had to stand on his father's grave in a churchyard in Epworth, England, because they wouldn't let him stand in his father's pulpit and preach the true gospel. And today, if you try to preach the true gospel instead of the faith prosperity gospel, or instead of the ecumenical gospel, they won't let you in the church either. They'll say, go out to the graveyard. You've got the reproach of the Lord on you. That's what made Paul keep going. That's what made Wesley keep going. That's what made Samson keep going. And that same strength is available to us. But you have to take the reproach of the Lord. To know rejection. Rejection by the world is one thing, but rejection by the church? That hurts. And it can even affect your family. We've got to understand about this hair. Again, in the Midrash, not a hair of your head will perish. Who are the hairs of the head? Of course, it points to the resurrection. That's the peshet. But what's the pesher? Turn with me, please, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 5. Ezekiel Hanavi, in the strength of God. As for you, son of man, now Ezekiel is an Old Testament type of Christ eschatologically. He's the only person called son of man other than Jesus. 
Whenever the scriptures speak of the return of Jesus, it's never as the Son of God. That's Him in eternity. The Son of Man is Him coming to earth. As for you, Son of Man, take a sharp sword. Take it and use it as a barber's razor on your head and beard. Now remember, that's humiliation. And like the Nazarite, he had to burn it. Ezekiel's a Nazarite. He had to take the vow. He had to burn, the, burn it, same as the Nazarite. Take the scales for weighing and divide the hair. One third you shall burn in the fire at the center of the city. When the days of the siege are completed, then you shall take one third and strike it with the sword all around the city. And one third you shall scatter to the wind, the Hebrew word for wind, ruach, being the word for spirit also. And I will unsheathe the sword after them. Take also a few in number from them and bind them to the edges of your robes. And again, take some of them and throw them into the fire and burn them in the fire. From it, a fire will spread to the house of Israel. Ezekiel is predicting or prophesying the final invasion of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians against Jerusalem. One third, one third, one third. One third of the hair he had to chop to bits with the sword. One third of his hair he had to scatter to the breeze and one third he had to burn in a fire. A few hairs he put in the edge of his garments. Because when the judgment came from Babylon, same as the Philistines, God always uses the heathen to judge his irrepentant people. Islam is a judgment on the infidelity of the church in Australia, in Britain, increasingly in America. That's why the Islamic invasions happened in the 7th, 8th century. It was a judgment on the idolatry in the Byzantine church with their graven images and their icons. It's a judgment. One third burn up, one third chop up, one third scatter. That's what happened to the Jews. One third of the Jews in Jerusalem were killed in the battle with the sword. One third were asphyxiated or burned, and one third were scattered into the diaspora of Babylon. Judgments have always happened to the Jews in thirds. In the Holocaust of the 1930s and 40s, when most of my wife's family were killed, that was one third of global Jewry and two thirds of world Jewry were wiped out. But it's not the only time. There's another two thirds coming. Look to the book of Zechariah, please, chapter 11, and understand what's happening here. I'm sorry, Zechariah 13. In chapter 12, you see what's happening now in the Middle East. The stage is being set for Zechariah 12. Jerusalem will be the stumbling block for all nations, Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 to 4 tells us. The issue in the Middle East will not be the final status of the Golan Heights. It will not be the final status of the West Bank. It will not be the final status of Gaza. It will be Jerusalem. That's where Satan got his biggest defeat. It's where he will get his final defeat. That's chapter 12. Chapter 13, what will happen as the Jews are regathered? Look at verse 8. It will come about in the, all the land, declares the Lord. Two-thirds of it will be cut off and perish. One-third will be left. They're the ones who will see Jesus when he comes back. Two-thirds of the Jews are going to be wiped out. That's painful for me. My children are Israeli Jews born in Galilee. But there is no security for the Jew outside of the palm of Jesus. The same as you have these neo-Nazi type groups, these dispatches people, teaching against Jews and teaching anti-Semitism in the church here in Queensland, they have one kind of nut in Queensland. The other kind of nut are the Christian Zionists who withhold the gospel from the Jews. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that the ambassadors of Christ are those who preach him. How can you misrepresent yourself as the embassy of a Jesus you don't preach? It says in Romans, with no preacher, how shall they hear? I'll require their blood of your hands, says the Lord in the book of Acts and in the book of Ezekiel. We love you, Jew. Go to hell. They're being regathered for the time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to be deceived by the Antichrist. Two-thirds of them will be wiped out. And Christians are trying to bring them back at the expense of not giving them the gospel. Now, I agree they're being brought back to fulfill prophecy, this prophecy. Something terrible is going to happen. A love for the Jew or for anybody else that does not give Christ is not the love of Christ. They have no biblical basis to withhold the message of salvation from the Jews. That is true of Ebenezer, it's true of the Christian embassy, and I will debate any of them in front of a video camera. As long as it's open to the public and videoed, I will debate any of them. I will debate Bruce Garbett tomorrow. These people are deceivers. They are not Christian and they're not an embassy. The real embassies of Jesus are those who preach him, the Messiah. Ebenezer Fund actually signed an agreement not to tell Jewish people Jesus is, is the Messiah. One of the people from our ministry asked them in England, if a Jew died in one of those boats and was going to die, if he collapsed and he was going to die, 
Would you let him enter eternity without his Messiah, or would you tell him Jesus is the Messiah, he needs to be saved? And he said, we can't tell him he's the Messiah. We signed an agreement. I love you, Jew, burn in hell forever. That's their gospel. Two forms of anti-Semitism. One want to murder Jews, the other want to murder Jews spiritually. Withholding the gospel is anti-Semitism. One third, one third, one third. Two thirds will be wiped out. Two thirds. Well, Ezekiel's day was one third, one third, one third, except for a few hairs. He said, take a few of them and put them in the fringes of your garment. If you've seen a Jewish prayer shawl, it's called a talit and there are 613 tassels on it, one for each commandment in the Torah. Those were the ones who didn't get chopped up, scattered, or burned. One for each of the commandments in the Torah. And that's where Ezekiel had to bind them. What does that mean? Those who kept the Word of God, the Word of God kept them. You understand? Those who kept the Word of God, the Word of God kept them. You keep the Word of God, no matter what disasters overtake this planet, the Word of God will keep you. But you see, Ezekiel lost his hair, because he's a Nazarite, a figure of the Nazarene. They ripped Jesus' hair out when he was crucified. In conclusion, let's go back to number six. We see that when the vow was over, it climaxed with this sacrifice, where there was a sin offering, a peace offering, and a burnt offering. Jesus is our peace offering. He's the burnt offering, the acceptable worship going up to God, and he's the sin offering. A, a lamb is in its prime at one year of age, and so Jesus is in his prime when he's killed. To God, one man without sin is worth more than all the men with sin. That's how one could die for all, so the lamb had to be without blemish at Passover, etc. This uses Paschal or Passover imagery. You see that they had to eat it with matzah, unleavened bread. If you've ever seen matzah, you know it's striped and it's pierced. The Talmud says it's striped and pierced, and both the Talmud and John chapter 6 tell us that the matzah corresponds to the flesh of the lamb. John 6 alludes to it. It's striped and pierced. Isaiah 53, by his stripes we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions. It's talking about Jesus. It's a picture of his death. Matzah is unleavened bread. Leaven in the Bible is a figure of three things interrelated. The first is sin. Secondly, most specifically, it is the sin of pride. Leaven contributes nothing to the nutritional value of bread. It only puffs it up. And so Paul says, put away the old leaven in 1 Corinthians 5. Your boasting is not good. It puffs up. Satan's first sin was pride, Isaiah 14. He wanted to be God. Man's first sin was pride, Genesis 3. wanted to be God. Pride is the seminal sin. It's the sin that undergirds other sin. You see a person with a problem with greed, under that greed is pride. You see a person with a problem with lust, under the lust is pride. You see a person with a problem with unrighteous anger, under that is pride. Pride is the sin that gives rise to other sin. We who have nothing to be proud of except Jesus. That's all we have to be proud of is what he did for us on the cross and in his resurrection. I have nothing to be proud of except Jesus Christ. Good looks, education, money... You have nothing that you haven't received. The only thing we can be proud of is Him. We, with nothing to be proud of except Him, struggle with pride every day. He who was God had no pride. There was no matzah in the leaven. There was no leaven in the matzah. But then there's a third meaning. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. False doctrine. When you see false doctrine, you're looking at sin and you're looking at spiritual pride. He had none of that. His teaching was true. It's a picture of the sacrifice of Christ. When the vow was over, then the Nazarite could drink wine. The vow is over, then the sacrifice. Makes the sacrifice and they remove his hair. Jesus is a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. As one who's despised and whom men would hide their faces, he took our sorrow. It's a reproach. Man of sorrows. No wine. Long. Roach. But then in the sacrifice, his hairs were ripped out. Just like Ezekiel. Nazarite prefigures a Nazarene. And he's humiliated. 
Having your hair removed is humiliated. He's hanging nearly naked on a Roman cross for my sin. I think about it. God becomes a man, and the Father takes my sin and puts it on his Son, and takes his righteousness and puts it on me. Who am I? I'm nothing. What a thing. What a thing. God becomes a man and takes my sin to give me his righteousness, and he hangs nearly naked on a Roman tree, defeated, humiliated before his enemies. Of course, it's a gambit. God turns it around with the resurrection. But that's how Jesus ended. And so that's how the Nazarite ends, in this state of humiliation. But look what it says once more in this wonderful verse of Numbers chapter 6. Verse 20. When the sacrifice is over, then the Nazarite may drink wine. Then he gets the joy. Look very briefly, please, at the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, once more in conclusion. Verse 10, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. He would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring prolong his days. The good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. The good pleasure will prosper in his hand. Then comes the joy after he's the offering. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satiated. Verse 12, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he'll divide the booty with the strong. When did Jesus get the joy? After the sacrifice was completed. First he's a reproach. Then he's humiliated. The sacrifice happens. Then he divides the booty with the strong. The joy comes after the sacrifice is completed. You know, the apostles asked Yeshua, Jesus, who's going to sit at your right hand or your left? And alluding to the imagery of the Passover triclinium table, he said, it's for the Father to give, not me. Who's going to, the, the Passover table, the triclinium, is a picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. Who's going to sit at your right or the left? Who's going to be closest to the host? I know who's going to be there. Those who took his reproach. The martyrs, those who suffered, those who stood, they're going to have the finest vintage. Jesus Christ is going to pour it personally at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Those who took his reproach. Then the Nazarite will drink wine. When the sacrifice is completed, when the victory is won, then the Nazarite drinks wine. You really want to be a strong Christian. You want the strength of the Lord in your life. You have to be a reproach. The Philistine has overrun the land. They can't get victory anymore. They're singing silly songs with the lyrics that aren't even biblical. When New Age, homosexuality, Eastern religion, the cults are taking over your country, taking your children's Christian future, and they're singing silly songs and falling down laughing in hysterics. They can't get the victory. It takes somebody who's a Nazarite. It takes somebody willing to take the reproach of the Lord. It takes a Wesley. That's what it takes. They threw him out of churches. He was banned from churches. But those churches dropped dead. Let's look. I thank God for those in your country who will take a stand. I'm not an Anglican or Reformed myself, but that new bishop, the Archbishop of, of, of Sydney, Peter Jensen, he stood against the ecumenical issue with Rome. He stood against Spang. I thank God for Philip Powell. I take the reproach. But if you really want to see Christians taking a reproach, you don't have far to travel. Just go to Indonesia. Then the Nazarite will drink wine. When the victory is won, when the price is paid, then and only then will the Nazarite drink wine. And then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and then I will bless them. 
Yevadecha Adonai ve Yishmerecha. Ya eh, la Adonai Panavelecha ve Yehu Necha. Yisa, la Adonai Panavelecha. Yaselecha. Shalom. Shalom, see you tomorrow.